so basically what we've covered to date is uh, an understanding of what the Jewish Bible teaches about the concept of the Messiah, where you would be able to find uh, basically a vision of what the Messiah is in the Jewish Bible, and uh, given that template, given that criteria, we understand that the Messiah has not yet come. Uh, we then began analyzing the Christian case for Jesus, which included the appeal to miracles and uh, understanding why that doesn't really uh, substantiate someone's claim to be the Messiah. And uh, we began looking at maybe understanding psychologically how it was possible for people to hold on to a belief in someone who failed as the Messiah. And uh, last week we began looking at the whole enterprise of what we call proof texting. Proof texting means that the Bible is employed, the Bible is used to prove right, what someone wants to assert. And so last week we basically introduced the idea that when Christian missionaries try to employ the Hebrew Bible, right, this goes back to the C circle. We had those cir different circles. So that C circle is the set of passages in the, in the Hebrew scriptures that missionaries try to use to prove not just that Jesus is the Messiah, but really to prove all of their doctrines. And so we saw last week that these proofs are based upon certain typical misreadings of the Hebrew scriptures. Um, they're almost all based upon circular reasoning, meaning they're all based upon the... the uh, the assumption of their conclusion before they actually go through the process of proving it, meaning the proofs only work because they have to assert the conclusion at the beginning of the process. And once they have achieved their goal, once they assert their belief, then they simply go back to find uh, material in the Bible that seems to back up that previously arrived at belief. But we saw that it's not uh, a belief which flows from the Bible. It's only a belief that can be somehow... Uh, shoehorned back into the Bible. And we saw that because of that circular reasoning, what often happens in the vast majority of cases is that they're quoting material out of context. And that's going to be a very, very critical theme that goes through not just the Messiah topic, but through every single topic that you would want to study. For example, is God uh, one? Is God an absolute unity? Or is God to be understood as a trinity. How should we understand God? So what you'll see, and I've done this as an experiment, basically you open up the Bible and just start identifying where is the Bible talking about God? Meaning, if you wanted to find passages where the topic of the passage is, who is God? Who is God? How are we to understand God? And you assembled all of those passages where the topic of the passage is God, right? you'll find that none of them, not one of them, has even a clue that God should be understood as a trinity. Right? All of them make it very clear that God is one. And if you looked at all the passages that Christians use to quote-unquote prove that God should be understood as a trinity, you'll see that if you look at those passages, none of them is a passage where the context is, who is God? And that will apply to every single topic in the Jewish-Christian divide. The Christian is only able to as assemble their passages by quoting verses out of context. And we'll see that tonight as well. So, tonight's topic is really probably the most central theological topic that we'll be covering. And we'll see that it has tremendous ramifications in terms of many different issues. Let's go back a little bit in terms of the history here. So there's a small group of Jews that uh, feel, that, that become attached to the possibility that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, right? They're, they're longing for redemption. They believe that this person will be the Redeemer. And then they are very, very shocked and disappointed when he is killed, when he's crucified. So we saw that the initial response to that, right, which is not absurd, the initial response was, right, I'll be back. You know, the idea that there'll be a second coming. That was the initial response. And again, within the realm of Judaism, that is not 
a concept which is foreign to Judaism. We believe in the idea of the resurrection of the dead. So that initial response was not something that broke with Judaism. The problem was, and this is very critical to understand, the problem was that when this doctrine of a second coming was proposed, it was not proposed as an indefinite process, meaning it wasn't proposed in a way where they said, one day, someday, he will return. If you look at the early formulations in the Christian Bible of the second coming, it's always in the context of returning in that first century, meaning that all of the predictions, I believe, that were put into the mouth of Jesus, I don't believe he spoke about himself coming back, I don't think he expected to die. That's why when he's crucified, you know, what they have him saying is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? He doesn't scream on the cross, touchdown, or mission accomplished. He seems to be acknowledging that something went very, very wrong. Right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Doesn't seem to be an acknowledgement that things went right. So he did not anticipate that he was going to die and have to come back. He thought he was the Messiah, and I think that when he was hanging on the cross, he understood I guess I really, I'm not, I think he came to that resolution, but many of his followers, again, it's important to realize, not all of his followers, probably some of the followers came to the same conclusion he came to. But some of them were not able to give up. And so they said, okay, but he'll be back. And so when they write these gospel accounts, they put into the mouth of Jesus statements talking about him returning. But all of them have him returning in that generation. Now, here's a big problem doesn't happen. He doesn't come back. And so even though, if you read a Christian Bible, and this is where it gets confusing, the first four books are the Gospels. And the first four books are the biographies of Jesus. Again, they're written Mark in the year 70 approximately, Matthew approximately the year 80, Luke approximately the year 90, John approximately the year 100. Those are the first books. And people, I guess, assume that those are the earliest books. But the truth of the matter is, the earliest books in the Christian Bible were written earlier. And those were some of the letters of Paul. And Paul is writing in the 50s. So Paul is writing 20 years before the first biographies of Jesus come out. And the very first letter that Paul writes is to the Thessalonians. And in this letter, one of the issues that comes up, is a very, very pressing issue, is it's now in the, in the 50s, right? This is the 50s. This is a generation later. He's executed in the year 30, 33. Now it's in the 50s, so it's a generation later. And people are saying, no, it's joint sight. What, you know, well, what's going on? They expected him to be back in that generation. And it's not happening. So that's, a, that's the second real crisis that this movement faces. The first crisis is the, re the crucifixion, when he's killed. Okay, they get over that crisis by postponing the redemption and saying he'll be back to, to finish the mission. But then he doesn't come back when they expected him to come back. Now what do you do? So we mentioned two weeks ago that this same problem affected the followers of Shabtai Tzvi. When Shabtai Tzvi converted to Islam, right, even though he had a huge Jewish messianic following, so one of the ways in which followers dealt with his conversion to Islam, this is, this is a, a, a very imaginative, they said, well, the, the one that converted, that person who's you know, in that Turkish jail, in that prison, that's not really Shabtai Tzvi. That's uh, some apparition, or it's a double. It's, some, it's not really our man. Our man is living now in a transcendent realm, maybe went up to heaven, and they said that he'll return at some point to redeem us. Right? So it's, it's similar to this second coming idea. But then he didn't come back, meaning that Shabtai Tzvi didn't return. So what do you do at that point? Meaning that all of your eggs are in that basket. All of your eggs are in the basket of the second coming, and it doesn't happen. So what the Shabtai Tzvi people did at that point, later on, was to propose, well, actually, actually, the Messiah was supposed to convert. That was all part of God's plan. Right? Meaning that the, the conversion of Shabtai Tzvi does not disprove his being Messiah. On the contrary, they say that's exactly what the Messiah was supposed to do. And they gave a Kabbalistic explanation that 
the whole purpose of the Messiah is to redeem the world from evil. So in order for Shabtai Tzvi to redeem the world from evil, he's got to get down into the evil, and that's why he converted, and they basically came up with a very fanciful, I would say, new concept, totally new concept of the Messiah in Judaism. You would never have found anything about the Messiah coming and having to convert to another religion. This is a total invention. At this point, the Sabbateans basically begin to break from Judaism. So in the first century, when Jesus fails to return, right? at that point, there's one of two choices. Either you say, oh, I guess we were mistaken. I guess he wasn't the Messiah, right? That, that we, we thought he was, he was killed, and then we thought he would come back, but he hasn't come back. Okay, we acknowledge that we were wrong. Or they come up with a new definition of Messiah that can accommodate a dead Messiah. Meaning, in the same way that the Sabbateans came up with a new concept of Mashiach that accommodates an apostate Messiah, an apost a Messiah that's become a Muslim. So the followers of Jesus, if they wanted to continue to believe in him, had to come up with a way of saying, no, that was all part of God's plan. The whole reason he came in the first place was to die. That's what he was supposed to do. Now, if they're going to give this kind of idea, if they're going to propose this idea, they would have to come up with a rationalization, with a, with a vision of why the Messiah dies that is both compelling, meaning that they couldn't come up with a reason that was trivial. They came up with a trivial reason that wouldn't really capture anyone's imagination. And secondly, it had to be a concept that would be invisible. Now, we learned earlier that the Jewish Messiah, you remember the, the criteria we had, one of the criteria was empirically verifiable, meaning we can see if someone is a Jewish Messiah. We can see the criteria, they're visible, right? The Jews returning to the land of Israel, rebuilding the temple, universal disarmament, world peace, everyone coming to believe. These are all things that you can see. They'll be reported in the newspaper. But if they're going to redefine the Messiah now, to talk about Jesus having to have died, not only does it have to be compelling, it has to be something that is invisible. Meaning it had to come up with a vision, with a definition, that could not be disproven right, by pointing to facts. So what they proposed was the following. They said that Jesus was the Messiah, and indeed he died, because that was all part of God's plan, because they now have a new concept of the Messiah. The Messiah comes, the purpose of the Messiah is to die for the sins of the world and to atone for the sins of those who would believe in him. Now, when you think about this, it is somewhat compelling. I Meaning the idea of someone being a martyr and taking upon themselves the sins of everybody else, you're taking one for the team, it's a noble idea. I mean, it's, it's, we're going to see that in, in Jewish thought, it's a completely unacceptable idea, but the idea itself is somewhat noble, and you could say it's certainly compelling, meaning that he seems to be dying for at least some kind of a good cause. And more importantly, it's invisible, meaning everyone could see Jesus dying. That's visible. But whether or not his death secures your forgiveness from sins, that's not visible. That takes place in a spiritual realm. You can't see whether or not your sins are forgiven. That's a matter of faith. A matter of faith cannot be disproven. And that's what they needed. They needed a new concept of Messiah that couldn't have been easily disproven. Now they have it. Right? They have a concept of the Messiah which is compelling, which is invisible, and that's what we're going to focus on tonight. The focus for tonight will be not just this concept. Uh, more importantly, it's going to be how missionaries sell this concept. And I will share with you an important observation. For most Jews, I would say, I would say a, a very large percentage of the, of the overall Jewish community, the topic of Messiah is not a very pressing uh, issue in their lives. I mean, most Jews probably don't think a lot about the topic of the Messiah. Probably a, a relatively small percentage of the entire Jewish people 
even believe in it or think about it that much or talk about it with their friends or really it doesn't occupy a big space in their brain. However, if you ask people whether or not they ever think about their personal failures, do they ever think about whether they've done things that are really, really wrong and uh, how do they deal with their personal failures, that's something which everybody takes seriously. I mean, most normal people have a conscience and most normal people think about regularly you know what they've done in their lives and if they've done things that are really really terrible it weighs on their conscience so here is a topic that Christians find very very useful to engage Jewish people on because no one's gonna say this is irrelevant right you talk about the Messiah to many Jewish people they say who cares Messiah Shmai, who cares about that but to talk about have you ever done anything wrong have you ever sinned? I mean, sin is a, is a dirty word in our world. Um, so they may avoid that word, because sin sounds like it's from, uh, you know, some religious fanatics. But to talk about people doing things that are wrong, have they ever really uh, had a personal failure? Have they ever really hurt other people? Uh, and how do, we, how do we handle that? How do we deal with that? That's the kind of topic that very few people will say is irrelevant. What Christians seize upon is the idea, and this is their, their point we're going to be looking at tonight, that the Jewish Bible requires, requires that we bring sacrifices in order to atone for our sins. That's the starting point of a vast majority of missionary arguments that Jewish people encounter. I'm going to share with you from a pamphlet that I found, I was only first interested in Judaism in my second year of university, actually the end of my first year of university. And I, I went to my home library, my hometown library in Fairlawn, New Jersey, and they had a huge, a huge section of Judaica, uh, maybe like uh, the size of this wall, filled with Jewish books. And I went through the books to try and find things to read about Judaism. And inside every one of these books, some missionary had inserted a little missionary pamphlet in every single Jewish book in the library. And I was very, like, uh, I, I was offended. Like, it's almost like intrusive. It is intrusive, not almost intrusive. So I remember going through all the books and pulling out all these pamphlets and getting a big stack. And every four or five months, I would go back and clean them out again. But this is one of those pamphlets, top of page 35 here. It's written by a man named B. Johnson, and it's called Israel Think. It's directed towards Jews. We want you Jews to think. And he says the following. Since you, in, in parentheses, by the way, you Jews, right? This is written to Jews. Since you Jews no longer observe the sacrificial system commanded by God and declared to you by Moses. I mean, we're not talking about something from the New Testament. We're saying to you Jews, this is your own Bible, right? Sacrifices were commanded by God and declared by Moses. So if that's the case, if that was the requirement, so he asked rhetorically here, so where in the scripture, where in the Bible, do you find justification for so doing? Meaning for not observing this anymore, right? Since you no longer observe these sacrifices, and yet he's saying that God requires it, how do you find justification for not bringing sacrifices? If it was necessary for Israel to make a blood atonement, for sin in the Mosaic dispensation, meaning if it was required in the Bible of Moses to bring sacrifices to be forgiven for your sins, and even up to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70, so why have you ceased, why have you stopped to bring your offering before God's altar? Why have you stopped? Is it because you no longer believe that you need a sin offering? Is it that you don't agree with God? Right? God says you need it, and you believe you don't need it? Now for his conclusion. He says, accusingly, you have no blood atonement at all. And watch very carefully now. This is critical. Watch what he does. He now quotes, this is a quotation mark, and he quotes, quote, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That means there's no forgiveness. For, quote, it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Where is he finding this passage? He says, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, Vayikra Yud Zion. 
therefore is including statement, therefore your sins are unatoned for, and your soul stands condemned before a holy God. That's the basic bare bones argument that missionaries make every day, every day of the week. This is, this is constantly broadcast, this simple message. Why it's powerful, by the way, you know, they always say keep it simple. It's a simple argument. It's easy to follow. You don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to understand what they're saying. They're saying, you know what, in the Bible, right, there was a big focus on sacrifices, and without them, you couldn't be forgiven. So how do you get forgiven for your sins these days? So that's going to be our initial subject of investigation. Is it true, is it true that according to the Hebrew Scriptures, according to the Jewish Bible, it's not possible to be forgiven for sins unless we bring a sacrifice. Let's just look for a moment at what the Christian Bible says about this topic. Matthew chapter 1, we looked at this last week, verse 21. It says about, uh, they, they say it's talking about uh, Mary here, and she shall bring forth a son, and you shall name, call his name Jesus. In Hebrew, Jesus might be some form of the name Yeshua or Yehoshua, which has the root of salvation in it. So why is he going to be called Yeshua or Jesus? Because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus' entire role is seen as being someone who saves people from their sins. That's what he came to do. It's not saying that he's coming to bring peace to the world or coming to uh, reestablish a Jewish political entity in their homeland. He's coming to basically save people from their sins. Now here I left out a chapter. It's book 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe. No, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, where Paul writes, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how the Messiah died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Meaning, Paul is saying here that the idea of the Messiah dying for our sins, he's saying, I didn't make it up. He's not saying it was a Johnny-come-lately idea. He's saying it's according to the scriptures. And when they say scriptures in the Christian Bible, they're referring to the Jewish Bible. There were no other scriptures at that point. Now watch something very interesting. What did B. Johnson say? He says that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. He quoted there, right? Remember at the beginning of the second paragraph, quote, he quotes, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness. For, quote, it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And where does he cite? What is his source for this? He cites Leviticus 17.11. Well, let's look it up, right? We always want to go to the video monitor and watch the replay, instant replay. So if you look on the left-hand side, here is Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Watch carefully. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar, it should be spelled A-L-T-A-R there, upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, does it say there that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness? It's not written in that verse. We'll discuss in a few moments whether the verse implies that. But it certainly doesn't say that. So where does it say that? Where does it say without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness? Look on the right hand side. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Not from the Jewish Bible. Hebrews is a book from the Christian Bible. And there the author says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So what we're going to be examining tonight is this very, very central issue. The Christian Bible certainly teaches, certainly teaches, that unless you have blood shed on your behalf, you can never be forgiven. The question is, is that what the Jewish Bible teaches? And the missionary argument is that, yes, that this idea is not just something in the Christian Bible, it's what the Jewish Bible teaches, and therefore, Jews have to follow it. That's going to be our focus for tonight. Now, if you remember from last week, we discussed the four different kinds of missionary manipulation of the Hebrew Bible. We mentioned, again, quoting out of context, and we mentioned mistranslation, and we mentioned even fabrication of verses that don't exist. Let's look at two examples here that are quite interesting. Romans chapter 11, on the left-hand side of the page, this is a book by Paul, one of the most important books in the Christian Bible. 
Watch what he says in Romans 11, verse 26. Paul writes, And so all of Israel will be saved, as it is written, again, Whenever the New Testament says, as it's written, it means as it's written in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. So Paul says, as it's written, quote, Out of Zion will come the Deliverer, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Where is Paul quoting from? So if you get any Christian Bible that has cross-references, they'll tell you, in case you don't know the Hebrew Bible by heart. He's quoting from the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, which we say every day in our prayers. In Isaiah, the verse reads as follows. And he will come, and he will come to Zion as a redeemer, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, says the Lord. Now, I believe that these two verses basically summarize almost the entire class tonight. Did Paul quote Isaiah accurately? So if you look at Paul and you look at Isaiah, you'll notice two differences. One minor and one real big doozy. The minor difference is that Paul says that the Redeemer comes from or out of Zion. And in Isaiah, the Redeemer comes to Zion. I wouldn't make a federal case out of that. That's not a big deal for us. But the next part is earth-shattering in terms of how significant the tampering is. Paul says that this Redeemer comes to do what? Why does Redeemer come according to Paul? And again, Paul is not taking credit for the idea. Paul's saying, I got this from the Hebrew Bible. He got a quotation here. Paul says the Redeemer is coming to banish ungodliness from Jacob, meaning he's coming to remove the sin from the Jewish people. The whole purpose of the Messiah coming is somehow to get the sins out of the Jewish people. What does Isaiah say, however? Isaiah says that this Redeemer will come to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, says the Lord. In Isaiah, the Redeemer doesn't come to remove the sins from these people. The Redeemer comes to people who have already on their own turned away from sin. If you read the 30th chapter of Dvarim, right, this is one of the most important messianic chapters in the Bible, it speaks about the Jewish people returning to God, right, returning to God, and then the redemption comes. So here you have a critical difference in conception, in vision, and it only works, it only works because Paul does not quote the Hebrew Bible accurately. He literally tampers with what the verse says. He changes totally what Isaiah said. That's the only way he's able to accomplish his reformulation of the messianic mandate, of the messianic job description. It's a critical difference. Let's look at one more interesting citation from Hebrews chapter 10. On the left-hand side again. Consequently, when Christ, or Messiah, came into the world, he said, now notice again a quotation here, Messiah said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. And then at the end of that passage, we skip down to verse 10. And it's by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of what body? The body of Jesus the Messiah once and for all. That's Hebrews chapter 10. So where are they quoting for? From? Where does the author of Hebrews get this quote, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you prepared for me? So again, any Christian Bible will tell you, it's in the book of Tehillim, Psalms chapter 40, where the author of Psalms says the following, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but my ears have you opened, osnaim karisali, burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. So in Psalms, there's no mention of a body being prepared. And the only way that the author of Hebrews is able to find a psalm that says what he would like it to say is by, again, making up the verse in Psalms himself. So these are, again, a little more illustration of what we studied last week. Now, if you go to the bottom of page 35 here, we see something interesting. Matthew chapter 1 said, 
that Jesus came as a savior, as a savior, right, to save us from sin. What's the Hebrew word that you might use for savior, a savior? So the Hebrew would be Moshiach, Moshiach. It sounds very much like the word Moshiach. So what happens in Christianity is a conflation, or I would say confusion, of these two biblical words. That the Mashiach, what we studied here a few weeks ago, in Christianity becomes the Mashiach. Because Jesus clearly was not the Mashiach of the Hebrew Bible. So he's transformed into a savior. A savior. A savior from sin. Now we're going to see something very interesting now. If we actually go through the Hebrew Bible and look up this word, salvation, save, savior, to save, what does it mean? When the Jewish Bible speaks about getting saved, does it speak about someone that is rescued from their sins? Or is something else being discussed? So let's look at a few examples. Again, the test to do this is very simple. I've done this in my Bible. I went through my Bible. I just put a little S next to every single time this word comes up in the Hebrew Bible. It comes up hundreds of times. There are many, many examples. Exodus 14 is one of the earliest ones. Not the earliest, one of the earliest ones. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Egyptians. That's when we got to cross the Red Sea. We were pursued by the Egyptians. We were, we were, we were basically between a rock and a hard place. The Egyptian army on one side, the, Red, the, 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 Red, the Reed, Sea of Reeds on the other side, and God splits the, right, the waters and we go through it. And God saved us out of the hands of the Egyptians. And then in chapter 15, in verse 2, the Jews sing that God has become their salvation. Right? They sing about the salvation that they just went through. If you turn the page to page 36, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, it speaks about the woman who is in the field. <coughs> this woman is alone in the field. And this betrothed damsel cried out, she was being attacked, and there was no one to save her. Right? No one to save her. And in Judges chapter 6, God looked upon him and said, Go in this your might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. And in 1 Samuel 7, And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord for God, our God for us, that he will save us out of the hands of the Philistines. And in 2 Samuel chapter 3, now then do it, for the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel out of the hands of the Philistines and out of the hands of all their enemies. And in 2 Kings 16, So Ahaz sent messengers to the king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria. In Nehemiah chapter 9, Therefore you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them, and in the time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard them from heaven, and according to your many full mercies, mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them out of the hands of their enemies. In Psalm chapter 20, if you look in verse 6, we see something interesting here. Here God saves his Messiah. Right? Here God saves his anointed one. Interesting that the, somehow the Messiah needs saving here. Uh, we could go on, we're not going to do them right now, but you see that if you've followed along, what does the idea of salvation mean in the Hebrew Bible? How would you define uh, this concept of salvation or saviors in the Hebrew Scriptures? What would be... Saved from physical harm. Right, from physical or political danger. That's what's going on. There's someone that's in danger physically, politically, and they're rescued. Basically, that's what's going on in the Bible. Again, remember the criteria we had? Clear and consistent. Clear and consistent. Over and over and over and over again. That's how the Bible describes this idea of salvation. The Bible doesn't say over and over and over again that we will be saved, people will save us from our sins. We'll see why later tonight. Now we're going to go back to the passage in question on the bottom of page 36 here. And we're going to now look at this concept of context. Remember in, in real estate, 
what's the critical concept in real estate? Location, location, location. And if you're studying the Bible, context, context, context. So, the missionary tells us, the missionary tells us that in the Jewish Bible, you have to have blood to be forgiven. Now, if you ask the missionary, where does it say that? They're going to say Leviticus 17.11. Guess what? That's their only reference. They don't have other references. That's their reference, Leviticus 17.11. So consistency we don't have, right? We don't have a dozen verses saying this. They only have one they point to. Now the question of clarity. Is this passage in Leviticus clearly teaching that the only way we can be forgiven for our sins is by having a blood sacrifice? So the first question we want to look at is context. If the Christian idea has any kind of plausibility, you would have thought that this chapter of Leviticus is dealing with what topic, meaning what, what should the context of Leviticus 17.11 be? What should it be from a Christian point of view? Topic should be what? How to get forgiven for your sins. That should be the, right, the, 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 the mega, the, the meta uh, context, right? That should be the overarching context of this chapter. So I'm going to give you an assignment now. I want you to read not just the verse the missionaries quote, verse 11, but read from verse 10 to verse 14. Read the whole passage. And I want you to do the following. When I was in junior high school, they would always ask us to read a passage and give it a title. Right? They would always ask us to do this. Read the passage, give it a title. So let's spend a few moments doing that now. speed readers. Okay. What's the title for this passage? Right. It seems that the title that you would give this passage, I wouldn't say don't eat blood because you have to drink it. I would say don't, the prohibition, here I would give it like this, the prohibition <coughs> against consuming blood. Right? That's what this seems to be. This seems to be a passage that deals with a dietary law, right? It doesn't seem that this passage is concerned primarily with teaching us how we should get forgiven for our sins. As a matter of fact, what's interesting, in the book of Vayikra in Leviticus, which is a book which deals a lot with sacrifices, the first several chapters, I think chapters 1 through 6 approximately, deal with the laws of sacrifices. Meaning, if you wanted to find a section in the book of Leviticus which talks about how to bring sacrifices and how to do them, chapters 1 through 6 would be where it teaches you what to do. <laughs> and in those six chapters, it never tells you that the only way you can get forgiven is through a sacrifice. We'll come back to this. But chapter 17 of Leviticus is not dealing with how you should bring sacrifices. Chapter 17 is a chapter basically telling you how not to to bring sacrifices. For example, in this chapter it tells you you may not bring a sacrifice outside of the altar. You can't bring it outside the temple, outside the sanctuary. And then here it says over here that the only reason that blood was given is to be spilled on the altar, but you can never eat blood. I Meaning, don't think you can eat the blood from the sacrifices. This chapter is not dealing with the principles of atonement. Let's go to page 37. Now, in the calculus of the missionary, in the calculus of the missionary, how did things work in the Bible? So it seems that their understanding is, basically, that in the times of the Bible, if a person sinned, they brought a sacrifice. That's what they seem to be assuming. That in the times of the Bible, if a person sinned, then they would have to bring a sacrifice. The truth of the matter is that if we read, again, those beginning chapters of Leviticus, which are the laws of sacrifices, the laws of the sin offering are discussed in chapter 4 of Leviticus. And what you'll see when you read chapter 4 is that the sin offering was not brought 
for any kind of sin. It was only brought, for example, for unintentional sins. If you sinned on purpose, for example, there was no option, there was no clause that you could bring a sin offering. Now what does it mean to sin unintentionally? Just so we understand. In Jewish law, they speak about basically three different kinds of activity. One is called mazid. Mazid means intentionally you're sinning with knowledge and forethought. You know that it's wrong and you're doing it. Then there is what is called shogeg. Shogeg does not mean so much accidentally, but it means unintentionally in the sense that either you didn't know that it was wrong. For example, you were not there in school that day when they taught that you're not supposed to cook on the Sabbath. You, do, you never knew that. You knew that this thing called the Sabbath. You never realized that you're not allowed to cook on the Sabbath. So you knew today was the Shabbat. You knew it was Saturday, but you didn't realize you're not allowed to cook, and you go ahead and cook. That's called Bishogeg. It's not intentional sin. Or you actually knew that it was wrong to cook. You actually learned that in school. You were there when they taught you that we don't cook on the Sabbath. But for some reason, you didn't know that today was Saturday. You got confused, and you thought today was Sunday, so you went ahead and cooked. That's considered shogeg. The third category is called ones, and rabbis teach us ones for achmona patre. If you do something accidentally, meaning you're not in control of your actions, then there's no culpability whatsoever. For example, if someone puts a gun to your head and says, cook for me on the Sabbath or I'm going to blow your brains out, then you're required to save your life and you're not really held responsible in any way, shape, or form. So the Christian idea that, yeah, basically there was a simple formula, if you sinned, you brought a sacrifice, not true. The sin offering was only for unintentional sins. Second problem. If the missionary is correct, if the missionary is correct, then it would seem that there are situations where people are going to be in trouble if they can't afford to bring a sacrifice. Now, the Bible discusses this in Leviticus chapter 5. And in Vayikra 5, the Bible raises the question. The Bible says, what if you can't afford a sheep? What if you can't afford a sheep? That's what the sin offering normally was, or the guilt offering here. So the Bible says, if you can't afford a sheep, you'll bring to God as your penalty for the sin that you have committed, two turtle doves or two pigeons. Now, a turtle dove or a pigeon is much, much cheaper than a sheep. So if you're unemployed or for whatever reason you can't afford to purchase a sheep, right, you can bring a much less expensive animal. But then the Bible asks, what if you're really, really destitute and you can't even afford a turtle dove or a pigeon? Look at verse 11. But if you cannot afford two turtle doves or two pigeons, you shall bring as your offering for the sin that you have committed one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. So how can the missionary insist that it's only blood that could atone for sins when the Bible here straight, straight out says that some people can bring flour, fine flour, that's their sacrifice. Let's go on even further. We mentioned a few minutes ago that you could not bring a sacrifice outside the temple. So it's very interesting that when Solomon, King Solomon, built the first temple, he gave probably one of the longest soliloquies in the Jewish Bible. He gave a very, very long speech in the first book of Kings, chapter 8. A very, very long speech, basically dedicating the temple. Now you can imagine, this would be very strange for someone to do, imagine you put up a big synagogue somewhere, a big brand new synagogue, and when the president of the synagogue is dedicating it, right, he talks about it being destroyed one day, or, you know, like, it's not the kind of topic you would normally bring up when you're dedicating this brand new place. But Solomon deals with this at the dedication of the temple. He says, if they sin against you, for God there is no man that does not sin. Everybody does the wrong thing once in a while. And if you be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, so they carry them away captive into the land of the enemy, far or near. So now we're not in Israel anymore. We're living somewhere else. There's no temple. And we can't bring sacrifices if there's no temple. So what do we do if we're in exile? 
So, if they shall bethink themselves in the land where they were carried captives, and what do they do? They repent and make supplication to you in the land of them that carried them captive, saying, We have sinned, we have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. And they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray to you toward their land which you gave to their fathers, and toward the city which you have chosen, and toward the house which I have built for your name. That's how we pray facing Jerusalem. Then hear their prayer and supplication in heaven, your dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you. So we see here that if we're living in exile and there's no temple, what Solomon could have said, I mean, if he knew about Christianity, he could have said, don't worry, the Messiah will die for your sins and you have to just believe in the Messiah. He could have spoken about that. He could have hinted that somehow when there's no temple, which is what's getting uh, Mr. B. Johnson all perplexed on the, the, the first page here, the Bible could have told us, don't worry, when there's no access to the temple, you'll have the Messiah who would have died for your sins and you believe in him, you're in the clear. So Solomon says, no, if we don't have access to the temple, we pray, we repent, we turn away from our sins, and then God will forgive us. Let's stop for a second and think. <clears throat> Imagine the following scenario. Actually, let's begin with a verse from the Bible. The missionary would have us believe that the antidote, the antidote to sin is sacrifice. That's what they're proposing. That the antidote, right, the way to deal with sin is with sacrifice. And their assumption is that that's the ticket. The Bible actually says that sacrifices in and of themselves do not atone for our sins. We're going to see in a few minutes in the book of Proverbs, King Solomon writes, that the sacrifice of a wicked person is an abomination to the Lord. Now let's think about what that means. So I want to tell you a scenario. Imagine that there's a couple and married for a few years, and the husband has a horrible habit of staying out late at night. He gets together with his friends and he goes to bars or whatever. He's playing cards. And he just comes home at like ungodly hours in the middle of the night. And his wife is staying up waiting for him. And she's worried and she's concerned. And he shows up at 3.30 in the morning and she finally explodes. And she says, listen, it's not fair. It's not right. Give me a break if you're going to come home late. Just call me. Tell me you're going to come home late. I shouldn't have to stay up all night worrying. Anyway, next week he goes out with his friends and he doesn't call her. And he realizes that uh, he's in big trouble now. So he says to himself, oh, I have a great idea. I know what I'm going to do. <clears throat> On the way home, I'll stop off at the 7-Eleven and I'll pick up a bouquet of flowers for her. And I come home and I'll just say, here, dear, I know how much you love these flowers, or he buys her a box of chocolate, with a big grin on his face. Here, he shows up at 4 o'clock in the morning with the flowers. So is she going to forgive him just because he came home with flowers? The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. As a matter of fact, she's going to be extra angry. You think that you can simply get off the hook now by coming up, showing up with flowers or a box of chocolates? That's not going to make her feel any better. That's a chutzpah. That's a nerve on his part. The sacrifice of a wicked person is an abomination to the Lord. If this person wants to be forgiven, he, can, he, he forgot to call his wife. He's going to show up at 3 o'clock in the morning. If he really expects her to forgive him, he's got to walk in that door, and he's got to look like a broken person. He's got to feel terrible. He has to tell her that he feels horrible, and that he's done something horrible. He's got to confess. He can't try and fluff it off. He can't make excuses. He's got to say, you know what? I'm taking ownership of what I've done, 
and I admit I did, I, I've, I've broken your trust, and I violated your our relationship, and he's got to basically confess to her. He has to admit he did something horrible, and he has to express his regret and his sorrow, and then he has to beg her, right? He has to pray for her forgiveness, and he's probably going to have to really, really make a good case for how he is going to change down the line. In the Bible, that process of of, of confession and prayer and, atone, and and repentance, right? That's called tshuva. That's called repentance. That's called returning, getting back to the original state before you did the wrong thing. That's what the Bible prescribes. We'll see this tonight. That's the antidote to sin. If you do something wrong, you know, it's interesting. We use in English this word sin. It's not a biblical <coughs> word. The Hebrew word is chet. Chet means to miss the mark. Like, if you're shooting at a, at a target, I remember when I was in Israel, they made the students in my yeshiva join the uh, Mishma Ezrahi, Ezrahi, the, the civilian guard. So they gave us an M1 rifle, which probably didn't work too well. And we did target practice. We got five shots. And they would say, Hichteta et hamatara. You missed the target, right? So, Chet is not so much sin. What does sin mean? It's a very Christian word. Because the, the implication of sin is that it's cosmic. The implication of sin is that it's bigger than life. The implication of sin is that, you know what, you can't do anything about it. You can't really, there's no human action that can address sin. And that's why in Christianity, sin can only be addressed by God, who has to come to this world, take on human form, and die as a sacrifice for your sins. As a human, right, you can't do it. We'll get to this later tonight. But the basic biblical idea is that if you do something wrong, if you violate God's relationship, the re response is not primarily sacrifices. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in a few minutes that one of the things the prophets emphasized over and over and over again was telling the Jewish people who made this mistake, they made the Christian mistake, they thought that if they sinned, all they have to do is bring sacrifices, schlep to the temple and bring a sacrifice, and everything's hunky-dory. The prophets kept on screaming at them, no, you don't get it. God doesn't want these sacrifices. God wants you to change. So the, the husband that comes home at 4 o'clock in the morning, he cannot expect to be forgiven just because he shows up with flowers. But if he sincerely and in a heartfelt manner admits he was wrong, and expresses tremendous remorse, and begs for forgiveness, and promises to change, so there's a very, very good chance she'll forgive him. Now, if he's smart, you show up with a gift. <laughs> like, if, you, if he's smart, you show up with the candy as well. Because what is the sacrifice? What is the candy? The sacrifice, again, does not get you forgiveness in and of itself. It's not like a magic wand that can wipe away sacrifices. The sacrifice is a physical symbol. It's an external symbol of an internal change. That's all the sacrifice is. It's an external symbol of an internal change. But the symbol by itself, without the change, that's what the prophet says. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. If you think that just the symbol by itself, if the symbol is not backed up by real... If, it's, if you're not walking the walk, if you're just talking the talk, then it's useless. It's even worse than useless. It's considered obnoxious. So the question is, what does the Bible teach about atonement from sins? Does the Bible teach us, yes, and if you sin, the response is blood? Or does the Bible say, no, the response to sin is basically repentance? So here we saw that in 1 Kings 8, Solomon says that if we don't have a temple, right, repentance and prayer, of course it works. Now let's see, I mentioned to you again, clear and consistent. Let's see the consistency now. Hosea chapter 14. You should know that Hosea was a prophet who prophesied to the ten northern tribes. He was a prophet to the ten northern tribes. When he was writing, when he was speaking, there actually was a temple in Jerusalem. He was actually speaking at a time when there was a temple. The problem was that the people living in northern Israel, in ten northern tribes, they couldn't get down to the temple because there was a war going on. It was a civil war. So he's speaking to Jews who couldn't get down to the temple in the south. And he says, again, we mentioned last week that the northern kingdom is called the kingdom of Israel, or they were called Ephraim, right? The southern two tribes is called Judah. 
the ten northern tribes called the kingdom of Israel. So he says, O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have fallen by your iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say to him, take away all of our iniquity and receive us graciously, and we will render the calves of our lips. He's speaking poetically here. What does he mean, the calves of our lips? Well, we can't bring calves on the altar. So what are the calves of our lips? This is prayer and confession. Prayer and confession. And that's why David says in Psalm 141, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands in prayer as an evening sacrifice. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Read carefully. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. There's no mention here about bringing sacrifices. It speaks about people who change, people who begin to get their act together. God will forgive them. Here's the verse in Proverbs that I spoke about. Chapter 15 in Proverbs, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is God's delight. What happens in the story of King David when David seems to commit two very serious crimes? He sends a man to his death, and then he has relations with this man's wife. And God sends the prophet Nathan to David, and Nathan confronts David indirectly. Nathan tells a whole story about a very wealthy man who has many, many, many flocks, and he has a neighbor who's a very poor man that has only one little sheep, and the rich man takes the one sheep of the poor man, and he serves it to a big party he's making, and David gets incensed and is furious and says, this person deserves to die, and Nathan the prophet says, you're the man! Right? I'm describing you! Because you took this man's one little sheep. So what does David do? David said to Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Very different from his predecessor, Saul, Shaul, the king, who never took responsibility for what he did that was wrong. David immediately confesses, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, now God has put away your sin. You will not die. I mean, that turning... That turning through confession is the way toward forgiveness. It doesn't say that David brought sacrifices here. And in Psalm 32, David writes about this incident. David said, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not hide my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Again, not through bringing a sacrifice. In Ezekiel, Yechezkel chapter 18, I suggest you read the whole chapter, because the whole chapter there, not an isolated verse plucked out of context, context, the whole chapter, 18 of Yechezkel, is about the topic of forgiveness for sins. Here he writes this, for example, But if the wicked man will turn away from all their sins that they have committed, and keep my statutes, and do what is lawful and right, they will surely live, they shall not die. None of the transgressions they have committed shall be remembered against them for the righteousness they have done, they shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God, and not rather that they should turn from their ways and live? So here in the whole chapter, he doesn't say one word about the importance of bringing sacrifices. The whole chapter is about turning from your wicked ways, repenting, changing, getting your act together, doing the right thing. The same basic theme in Ezekiel chapter 33. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die yet. If they turn from their sins and do what is lawful and right, etc., they'll be forgiven. Top of the next column, Jeremiah 36. It may be that when the house of Judah hears all the disasters I intend to do to them, all of them may turn from their evil ways so I might forgive their iniquity and their sin. It doesn't speak about having to bring sacrifices to be forgiven. He speaks about them changing, turning from their evil ways. Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him when he's near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy upon them 
and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And then we have a story where the Jewish prophet comes to a city of non-Jews. And he comes to the city of Ninveh, this is the prophet Jonah, and he tells them, in 40 days, this city is going to be overturned. In 40 days, Ninveh will be overturned. And in verse 6, when the news reached the king of Ninveh, he rose from his throne, he removed his robe, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. And he made a proclamation in Ninveh, saying that all of you better start bringing animal sacrifices or you'll never be forgiven. He doesn't say that. He says, by the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. And they shall all turn from their evil ways and from the violence that's in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger, so we do not perish. And in verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways... It doesn't say that God saw their blood. It didn't say God saw their sacrifices. God saw they turned from their evil ways. They did tshuva. They repented. God changed his mind about the calamity he said he would bring upon them. He did not do it. Daniel chapter 4, another non-Jewish story. Daniel, the Jewish prince, amazing young man named Daniel, speaks to the king of Bavel and says, Therefore, O king, may my counsel be acceptable to you Atone for your sins with righteousness and your iniquities with mercy to the oppressed. doesn't advise him to have to bring sacrifices. Eov, the book of Job, if you return to the Almighty, you'll be restored. If you remove unrighteousness from your tents. Proverbs 16, by loyalty and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. In Isaiah chapter 1, the prophet says to the Jewish people, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they're as sinful as red scarlet, they will be like snow. They'll become white and pure like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will become like wool. If what? He says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. He doesn't tell them if you start bringing sacrifices. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in a few minutes, he tells them specifically that sacrifices is not going to do the trick. Look on page 39. On this page, we're going to see examples where the prophet scolded the Jewish people for thinking that the antidote to sin is sacrifice. Isaiah chapter 1, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have enough of your burnt offerings and rams and fats of beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls. You would think from a Christian point of view... God delights in sacrificing blood. That's what he wants. God in Isaiah says, no, it's not what I really delight in. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bring sacrifice offerings is an abomination to me. Now, don't think for a minute, this is the way this is sometimes misinterpreted, that the prophets were telling the Jewish people that sacrifices played no role. <coughs> Again, sacrifices play a role, only if they're offered appropriately. Meaning, if they're coming as an add-on to a changed person, as an expression of the changed person, then they're required. The Bible requires, at least if you committed a sin unintentionally, and to the temple, then you're supposed to bring a sacrifice. But that sacrifice, again, in and of itself, is not the critical element that gets you forgiven. The critical element is the change that you've gone through. So Isaiah here is going to be one of many prophets that says to the Jewish people, the way you're bringing sacrifices, you're not my sacrifices, God would be saying. My sacrifices, if you did it properly, would be great. It's your sacrifices that I can't stand, God says, because you're hypocrites. So in verse 16, what does God say? Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes, Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. These are the kind of things you've got to focus on. Not just bring a sacrifice, that's easy. Amos chapter 5, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, God says, I will not accept them. And offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. God says, take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But... 
let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an everlasting stream. That's what I want, God says. Psalm 51, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifices. That's not the bottom line. That's not where it's at. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. This God you will not despise. Micha, chapter 6, top of the next column. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before God with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will God be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No, God has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does God require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God, that is what is required. Proverbs 21, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to God than sacrifice. In Hosea chapter 6, again, I desire a steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Again, a constant theme throughout the Bible. Now, we're going to raise another question. Let's stop and think for a second. If the Christian asserts, the missionary asserts, that unless you bring a blood sacrifice, you cannot be forgiven, what's the problem with that? To say that unless you bring a sacrifice, you cannot be forgiven, one of the problems is that it seems to be limiting God. And somehow God is not able to forgive you unless you bring a sacrifice. We would have assumed that God is capable of doing anything. So to insist that God cannot forgive you unless you bring a sacrifice seems to be putting a limit on God. If we go through the Bible, we're going to see that God repeats over and over and over again, you know what? He forgives us to a great extent because He is merciful. He is compassionate. He is very, very loving towards us. And even if we don't sometimes repent properly, meaning even if we don't even repent properly, God says many times in the Bible, He will forgive us just because that's His agenda. So sometimes it doesn't even require that we repent. And if you go through Moses, he would sometimes appeal to God and say, look God, if you don't forgive the Jewish people, how will this look in the eyes of the nations of the world? Right? You're going to be uh, ashamed. You're going to look uh, like an impotent God. So there are many reasons why God might forgive us without sacrifices, even without proper atonement. <clears throat> Psalm 78. They remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer, but they flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him, they were not true to his covenant, yet he, God, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Often he restrained his anger and did not stir up all of his wrath. Why? Because he remembered that they were but flesh. You know what? God ultimately knows, you know what? We're basically just human beings. We have limitations. And so because we are just human beings that are flesh and bones, with a lot of weaknesses, God has mercy and compassion upon us. Micha chapter 7. Who is God like you, who pardons iniquity, passes over the transgression of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in showing clemency. He will again have compassion upon us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and, and unswerving loyalty to Abraham, etc. So this is a whole series of passages going to the middle of the next page where the Bible emphasizes over and over again consistently that God is merciful and sometimes forgives us simply because of his mercy, not because of what we do. Now I'm going to raise another question. This next question is a very, very serious problem for the Christian missionary. There seems to be a clear teaching in the Christian Bible that Jesus is the final, once and for all, sacrifice. 
Christian Bible seems to be teaching that once Jesus came as a sacrifice, that's it. There are no more sacrifices that have to be brought. We see this, for example, in Hebrews chapter 10, where it says in verse 18, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. There is no more offerings needed for sin. And that's why Christians say that 40 years after the death of Jesus, the temple was destroyed, and we have not had a temple for the past 2,000 years. Now, before we go on, I, I, I want to just go back for a minute and make sure that I, I, I explain two points that are important to remember. I didn't cover these before. Keep your hand on page 40 here, but go back for a minute to the very first page, and you'll see that Mr. Johnson says that not only did God command us to bring sacrifices in the Bible, but we even brought sacrifices up until the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70, he says. Is that true? That we continue to bring sacrifices up until the destruction of the Jerusalem in the year 70? Actually, he seems, he seems to forget about the destruction of the first temple. I mean, that in the Christian mind, there's sort of like a, a seamless story here. God gives the laws of sacrifices. The Jews have those laws. And then God replaces those laws with Jesus. And then the temple is destroyed. So before Jesus, they had a temple. But they didn't always have a temple. The first temple was destroyed over 400 years before Jesus came. So how did the Jews get forgiven for their sins when the first temple was destroyed? Right, that he seems to sort of slide over here, glide over that. I wanted to just to tie up one more point that I, I really should have tied up before. I want you to look at the bottom of page 36. The bottom of page 36. And this critical verse, verse 17, chapter 17, verse 11. We really, I needed to sort of tie that up with you. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you for making atonement for your lives on the altar. For as life, it's the blood that makes atonement. Now, is this saying that the only way of being forgiven is through a blood sacrifice? Is it saying that? I'll rephrase my question. In order to say that clearly, how should the verse have read? What should the verse have said? It should have said, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given to you for making atonement for your lives on the altar, for as life, it is only the blood. I mean that the verse could have used the word only if it's true that the only way of being forgiven is through a blood sacrifice. Now again, the missionary still feels comfortable reading this verse to be saying that you have to have a sacrifice to be forgiven. Why? Because it says... For the blood makes atonement. It says the blood makes atonement. A little bit of a, of a technicality here. Really the grammar would be saying blood makes an atonement. It's not saying blood makes the atonement. Meaning that there's no specific focus on the blood. Let me explain what the passage means. Imagine, if you will, that... Uh, Little Johnny comes home from school one day, and his mother isn't, uh, you know, the, the best provider in the world, so she puts out dinner for him. What's on the dinner plate? So there's a pile of spaghetti, there's some broccoli, and there's some jello. Probably you have to call up social serve, you know, public service, little services for this kid. So that's what he has on the plate: the spaghetti, the broccoli, and the jello. And the mother says, Johnny. It's very important that you eat the broccoli because it's the broccoli that provides the nutrition. Now, when she says it's the broccoli that provides the nutrition, is she saying that the only thing on the planet that's nutritious is broccoli? No, what she's saying is on this plate, on this plate, the broccoli is the nutritious stuff. So when the Torah says here 
that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you for making atonement for your lives on the altar, for as life, it's the blood that makes atonement. What it's saying is, not that the only way of being forgiven is through a blood sacrifice. It's saying that when you bring a blood sacrifice, when you bring a blood sacrifice, what part of the animal is critical for making the sacrifice? Meaning, what is the critical part of the animal that has to be offered in order to have a proper sacrifice? Is it the hair? Is it the eyeball? Is it the earlobe? Is it the kneecaps? I mean, there are lots of parts of the animal that could be sacrificed. It's saying that because the blood contains the life force of the animal, because the blood is so critical as the life force of the animal, then when you bring a sacrifice, the critical part of the animal to make the sacrifice a legitimate sacrifice is the blood. But it's not telling you here that the only way of being forgiven for any of your sins is through having a sacrifice. It's simply saying when you bring a sacrifice, it has to have blood. Not that you have to have blood and a sacrifice to be forgiven. So now we go back to page 40. And in the book of Hebrews, it says that once Jesus came as a sacrifice for sin, there is no longer any sin offering. The problem here is a real, real serious one. We learned a few weeks ago that one of the critical elements of the messianic vision is that when the Messiah finally comes, the temple is going to be restored. There are several chapters in the book of Yechezkel, after chapter 40, where he writes about what this third temple is going to look like. And we saw that the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem comes up in many of the messianic prophecies. It comes up in Ezekiel chapter 37. It comes up in Isaiah. We're going to see here that it comes up over and over and over again. There's going to be a third temple. And guess what? Not just with sacrifices, even sin offerings. So from a Christian point of view, why in the world are we going to have to have sin sacrifices if Jesus is the final once and for all sin offering? Let's turn to the bottom of page 40, Ezekiel chapter 37. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. We learned this one before. It was on one of our B circles. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. And my tabernacle will be with them, etc. Ezekiel chapter 45, on the bottom of the page. On that day, the prince will provide for himself and all the people of the land the young bull for a sin offering. Many commentaries suggest the prince in these chapters of Yechezkel is referring to the Messiah, the princely Messiah. So the Messiah himself is going to bring a sin offering. This hasn't happened yet. So the Messiah is going to come to the temple, a restored temple, and bring a sin offering. It wouldn't seem to be necessary from a Christian point of view. Again, we have on the bottom of page 40, the prophet Zechariah, and on the top of page 41, several other passages which speak again about the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem and the restoration of the sacrificial system. In the middle of page 41, here is a, is a complicated topic, but let's explore it for a few moments. The Christian idea of atonement is called often vicarious atonement. Vicarious suffering, meaning the innocent person dies, the innocent person suffers, and the wicked person is forgiven. That's the Christian calculus, that the person that's punished is the innocent one, Jesus, and the guilty people are now forgiven because the innocent one was punished. Is that what the Jewish Bible speaks about? That it's the innocent person that gets punished? So we have, interestingly, in chapter 32 of Exodus, Moses proposing this very idea to God after God wanted to destroy the Jewish people for building the golden calf. Moses says, don't kill them, take me instead. Moses is willing to give up his life to save all the Jewish people. And what does God say to him? But Moses says, but now if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book you have written. But God said to Moses, no! 
whoever has sinned against me, I'll blot his name out of my book. Meaning, I'm not going to punish you who is innocent. It's the person that's guilty that will be punished. In Deuteronomy 24, parents will not be put to death for their children, nor children be put to death for their parents. Only for their own sins are people to be put to death. You're not put to death for someone else's sins. In the Christian Bible, in the book of Romans, it says that Jesus came to justify the wicked. It's a passage in the book of Romans. Jesus came to justify the wicked. In Proverbs 17, Solomon says that he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, they are like an abomination to the Lord. Now, one of the questions that's often asked is, well, wait a second. Doesn't the Bible say that I'll visit the sins of the fathers onto their children to the third and fourth generation? Doesn't the Bible seem to say that God will punish right, innocent people for what the wicked people did? So it's a, it's a complicated passage. I'll share with you one way of understanding it. When you read this passage in the Bible, God says, I will visit or remember the sins of the fathers onto their children to the third and fourth generation. And why did the Bible have to say third and fourth generation? It just should have said, I'll remember or visit the sins of the fathers onto their children. So when you think about it, who's the third generation? That are, those are your grandparents. Most people have had some exposure to their grandparents. Who's the fourth generation? Those are your great-grandparents. Some people have had some contact with their great-grandparents. But most people on the planet, 99.9%, never have exposure to the fifth generation. Meaning, most people, if they ever met their great, great grandparents, they might have been just three months old. So why does the Bible speak about this idea that I'm going to remember or visit the sins of the fathers onto the children to the third and fourth generation? It's not telling you here that God's going to punish you for what they did. It's saying that when God judges you, he will take into account, he will remember what your ancestors did going back to those ancestors who you were exposed to. And if you grew up in a home where your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents or all of them were evil, wicked sinners, and that's the kind of world you grew up in, so that when God judges you, he'll take that into consideration, meaning God will take into consideration the sins of your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents because you need to be judged a little bit more uh, with mercy, meaning that you were not given a clean slate to work with. you got to be judged a little bit more mercifully because you grew up in a very, very handicapped environment. You were, only were exposed to sin. So God will take into account, not that God will bring their sins upon you. There are other ways of explaining it, but that's just for the moment. Now we're going to conclude with two more ideas, I think, and we'll be able to conclude for tonight. The next thought, uh, you're going to have to basically... <coughs> for a few moments and meditate with me. Don't look in your books anymore. And let's think about something. When someone was crucified, what was the cause of death? What was the cause of death when a person was crucified? Treachery. What was that? Treachery. Now, what, was the yes. what was the cause of death? Dehydration. Dehydration is not the <coughs> primary... Okay, it was not bleeding, for sure not bleeding. The cause of death was shock and, as, and asphyxiation. It was shock and asphyxiation. Dehydration played a part of it in weakening the person. What happened was the following. The person may have had their wrists pierced, um, maybe possibly their ankles, but maybe the ankles were just tied to the board. But what happened was the following. They were hanging like this. And what happens when they're hanging is that they're chest cavity begins to compress their diaphragm and it becomes very difficult to breathe. So what happens is the person's hanging there and is having difficulty breathing. So what they do is there is a post where their legs are being supported. They begin to prop themselves up by their legs and now they can expand their chest cavity and they can breathe. But they can only do that for so long because they're going to get tired and they're going to collapse again. And that's why this method of execution was so vicious because the person lingered back and forth between being able to breathe and then collapsing because of their being exhausted and dehydrated, and they would just basically take several days until they died from shock and asphyxiation. In the Christian Bible, what we're told is the following, that Jesus is crucified on a Friday, 
and there are two other people on either side of him. So there's three people up on this hill. And the Christian Bible says that the Romans were nice guys, and they didn't want to have Jewish people hanging on a cross over the Sabbath. So that when people were crucified close to the Sabbath, what they would do as a matter of course was in order to make sure they couldn't prop themselves up and be able to breathe, they would come around with a big mallet and they'd break their legs. And when they broke their legs, they wouldn't be able to prop themselves up and they would die pretty quickly. That's what the Christian Bible says. It goes on to say, but that's what happened. That Friday they came and they broke the legs of the guys next to Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. He was already dead. Now, just put that in your hard drive. Put that in your hard drive. I'll tell you another story. I once had a discussion with a missionary, and the missionary gave me this uh, line that, you know what, without a sacrifice, you can't be forgiven. You have to have a sacrifice, and since you have no temple these days, it's only the sacrifice of Jesus. And I said that, where do you see in the Bible that um, you have to have a blood sacrifice? So he shows me here in Leviticus 17, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So I said, so you believe that in order to be forgiven, there has to be the shedding of blood. So he said, yes. So I said, well, it happens that last night I was home making my sandwich for lunch today. And I was making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I was cutting the bread and the knife slipped and I cut my finger and it bled all over the kitchen floor. Praise the God, my sins are all forgiven. Because the shedding of blood is the forgiveness of sins. That's, I basically proposed that I should be forgiven for all my sins because there was a shedding of blood. So he looks at me like I'm crazy and he says, listen, uh, Rabbi Skoback, you can't make up your own religion. The Bible has rules for sacrifices. You can't just cut your finger in the kitchen. Right? There are rules for sacrifices. <clears throat> so I said, oh, there are rules for sacrifices? Did Jesus, in his sacrifice, meet the requirements of the biblical rules for sacrifices? For example... In the Bible, who was the one that could bring a sacrifice, could actually offer it as a sacrifice? It had to be someone from a certain Jewish tribe, the tribe of Levi. And it was the priests, the Kohanim, from the Levite tribe. You couldn't be a Roman soldier, not even a regular Israelite could bring a sacrifice. Sacrifices had to be burnt. All of them were burnt. Jesus was not burnt. Sacrifices had to be perfect without blemish. Meaning that if it had a little nick on it, it wasn't a kosher sacrifice. <clears throat> Jesus was beaten. He had a crown of thorns put on his head. His side was pierced by a Roman spear. He was circumcised. Paul, in the New Testament, calls circumcision mutilation. So he's certainly not fulfilling the law of the sacrifice being unblemished. The sacrifice, again, this is his verse, 1711. God's given you the... the, the Right? The blood where? The blood upon the altar, it says in, in their verse, right? I've given you the blood upon the altar to make atonement for your sins. Not on a, a little hill outside of the Temple Mount. Meaning that the Bible has all these laws of sacrifices, and Jesus seems to have not fulfilled any of these laws. The Bible speaks about human sacrifice in very, very negative terms. Human sacrifice is certainly not allowed. So the missionary is trying to invalidate my peanut butter and jelly scenario by saying that it didn't fulfill the biblical laws of sacrifice. I said, et tu, missionary, your sacrifice as well doesn't fulfill any of the laws of sacrifices. So he says to me, you anal retentive Orthodox Jews, you're so caught up in your picky you know, with the the letter of the law, you don't understand, he said to me. You don't understand. Jesus was not a literal sacrifice. He was a figurative sacrifice. It was a symbolic sacrifice. Don't get so caught up with fill every little tiny law you have to fulfill. Okay, you know, fine. So you're saying to me that Jesus, th there was no concern with him being a literal sacrifice. It wasn't so important because he wasn't a real sacrifice. Yes, I was told. So now I went through this whole 
story about his crucifixion and how when they finally found him, he was already dead. They didn't have to break his legs. And look at now what the Gospel of John says in chapter 19. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. I mean, that the Gospel of John says this whole story where the Romans came to break his legs, and it happened they didn't have to break his legs, thank God, because he was already dead, and now they were able to fulfill this requirement where the Bible says none of his bones shall be broken. Now, where does the Jewish Bible say none of his bones shall be broken? It's regarding the Passover sacrifice. This is one of the strangest things about Christianity is they're using the Passover sacrifice as the, as the paradigm for Jesus. Meaning, if I wanted to find something in the Bible for Jesus to correspond to, right? if I wanted to find an analog, a biblical analog for Jesus, what should I have chosen? What would have made sense? I want to find an analog to some, for someone that's going to die for general sacrifice for everyone's sins. A Yom Kippur! We have a Day of Atonement, and there's a Seir HaMistaleach, right? We have the scapegoat that was sent out, and on the back of this animal were carried all the sins of the Jewish people. All the sins! A general sacrifice for everything. That would have been a good parallel to Jesus. The Passover sacrifice... The Passover sacrifice had nothing to do with sins at all. The Corbin Pesach had absolutely nothing to do with sins. So why is it so important to make Jesus into the Passover? As a matter of fact, it's even worse. What was the Passover sacrifice? When the Jewish people were in Egypt, it was a way for them to express and show their rejection of Egyptian idolatry. The whole Corbin Pesach, right, the, the lamb was worshipped in Egypt. Aries, that was the month they were left in Egypt, as Aries, the, the zodiacal sign of that month, the god of the Egyptians, the Jewish people were to take this god, tie it up to their beds for four days, right? To really, like, right in the face of the Egyptians, we're taking your god and we're tying it up to our beds, and if you ask us what we're going to do with it, we're going to kill it in four days and eat it. That's, that was to show the Jewish rejection of the Egyptian idolatry. What a strange symbol for Jesus. On some level, the deification of a human being is not a rejection of idolatry. From a Jewish point of view, the deification of a human being is very similar to almost all ancient pagan idolatries, where human beings are deified. So John basically tells us here that from his point of view, Jesus was not just a figurative, symbolic sacrifice. From John's point of view, it was very, very important for Jesus to be dead before those Romans came to break his legs because it was important to literally fulfill this requirement of the Corbin Pesach, the Passover lamb, that none of his bones shall be broken. So I said to the missionary, well, which one is it? Is Jesus a literal sacrifice or a figurative sacrifice? You can't have it both ways. That's basically where the conversation ended. Let's conclude now with uh, just one more final thought. What is the missionary response to what I've said tonight? What would, what would they say? So the basic missionary response is as follows. Listen carefully. There's a verse in the book of Galatians. It's not in your booklets here. It's Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, where Paul says the following. Paul says, if righteousness could come by observing the Torah, if righteousness could come by keeping, by observing the Torah, then Jesus died in vain. I believe it's one of the most significant verses in the Christian Bible. Paul is saying that if righteousness could come, if you could be righteous by keeping the Torah, then Jesus died in vain. What we see from this is that the belief system here is that, you know what? You cannot keep the Torah. It's impossible 
to keep the Torah. And since you can't keep the Torah, and you can't fulfill the requirements of the Torah, you can't really live according to God's law, what they're saying is ultimately, this whole idea that you're proposing, Rabbi Skobach, that you're going to get your act together, and you're going to be a good guy from now on, and you're going to follow the rules, it can't happen. You're not able to be a good person. You can't follow the rules. You basically are corrupted from the moment that Adam and Eve ate that fruit in the Garden of Eden. Sin entered you. Sin basically defines who you are. You're under the control of Satan. You're not able to be good. You're a miserable sinner. You're incapable of being good. You're incapable of being righteous. You cannot really repent. In theory, it sounds good. You gave a good class tonight, Rabbi Skobach, but it's just not possible. It cannot be done. As a matter of fact, I remember I once had a conversation with one of the leading missionaries here in Toronto, and I asked him, why did God give the Jewish people the Torah? Why did God give us this five books of Moses with all these commandments? And he said to me, you know why God gave the Torah to the Jewish people? To show you that you're incapable of keeping them. Meaning God gave you all those laws to show you that you're not able to keep them. And what is the purpose of the Torah then? The purpose, he said, of the Torah is that it's a mirror. And when you look into that mirror, you'll see how filthy you are, how much of a sinner you are, and you'll realize that you're corrupt and you can't be good, and then you'll turn yourself over to Jesus and you'll say, thank you for dying for my sins. That is, at least according to Paul and Martin Luther, their understanding of the Torah. It was given to show that we cannot do it. And the basic premise of Christianity is that we cannot do it. Because Paul says, if we could do it, then Jesus died in vain. Who needs him to die for me if I can atone for my old sins through repentance? Paul acknowledges this. If I could do it, then Jesus died in vain. So the premise is we cannot do it. Cannot be good. And the Christian argument is that it's impossible to be righteous. The problem is that if we go through the Torah... Torah makes it very, very clear that, number one, you can do it. As a matter of fact, immediately, immediately after the Garden of Eden story, when you might have thought, oh, maybe Adam and Eve, they ruined it for everyone, and now we can never be good. So immediately, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, God says to Cain, we're on verse four, page 42 now, He says to Cain, why are you angry, Cain? Why are you wroth? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well shall you not be accepted. And if you do not do well, sin waits at the door, and he, sin, desires you, he's going to tempt you. But what does God say to Cain? But you can rule over him. You have the ability to rule over sin. And we see that if you go through the Bible carefully, again, do this experiment, right? Every time it says salvation, do this experiment. Every time it speaks about righteous people, and every time it speaks about wicked people, guess what? the contrast between those who are righteous and those who are wicked comes up almost on every page of the Bible. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of times, the Bible contrasts the righteous to the wicked. What do we see from here? That there are righteous people, and there are wicked people. And what is the message of the Bible? You be one of the righteous ones. And that's why God says in Deuteronomy, See, I set before you today, blessing and curse, good and evil, right, life and death, God says, choose life. So God is saying, we can make the choice. We can make the choice. It's not something which is impossible. And God says in the book of Deuteronomy the same thing. Don't say, don't say that the Torah is too difficult to, to keep. Don't say the Torah is up in the heavens, that who should go up to the heaven and do it for us. Don't say it's beyond the sea, that who's going to be able to travel so far to keep it. It says in the book of Deuteronomy, the Torah, listen carefully, this is what God says. The Torah is very close to you in your mouth and in your heart that you can do it. Paul does something incredible. When Paul builds a sermon around this verse in Deuteronomy, Paul says it's not talking about the ability to keep the Torah. Paul transforms it into a, a sermon against the importance of the Torah and basically clips, the same way we learned last week that Matthew clipped Hosea chapter 2, or Hosea chapter 11, I think. Paul clips the end of this verse. And Paul transforms this from a passage, if you read Deuteronomy 30, 
The whole chapter is about keeping the Torah, observing the commandments. Paul turns it into a sermon about faith alone. Only faith. Only what you believe, not what you do. And Paul concludes by saying, it's near to you in your heart and in your mouth. Stops the verse there. He doesn't quote where it says that you can do it. So he says it's close to you in your mouth and in your heart, and then he says that's the word of faith that we're preaching. In your heart and in your mouth. Just faith. Paul's only able to pull that off by again clipping the verse. So if you go through the Bible, you'll see over and over and over again the Bible speaks about the righteous and the wicked hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Clearly, there are righteous people. It's possible to be righteous. One of the passages that Christians like to point to is on page 43, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, Kohelet chapter 7, which says, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. So the missionary says, You see, it says right there in the Jewish Bible, there's no good people. It doesn't say that. It's saying that, you know what? Even the good person sometimes makes mistakes. Even the good person... <clears throat> It's not saying that there are no good people. It's saying there is not a righteous person on the earth who only does good, who never sins. I mean, there are righteous people, but none of them is perfect in that they never make mistakes. Only God is perfect. Only God does not make mistakes. But Kohelis is saying that, you know what, even righteous people sometimes make mistakes. What does it say in the book of Proverbs? One of the most important verses in the Bible. It says, Sheva, Yipol, Tzadik, the come. Seven times the righteous person will fall, but they will get up. So obviously, falling, making a mistake, does not negate your being righteous. As a matter of fact, the way Rav Huttner from, from Chaim Berlin understood the verse is that the righteous person became righteous through the process of falling down and picking himself up, meaning going through a process of growth, where they made mistakes, they fixed the mistakes. We always say in life, we learn the most from our mistakes. Take any great person, they learn from their mistakes how to improve. So the Bible says not that there are no righteous people. It's that there are righteous people, and even righteous people sometimes make mistakes. We're going to share one more verse from the Christian Bible, and we'll end for tonight. Psalm 14, verse 2. I'm sorry, verse 3. Psalm 14, verse 3. This verse is quoted by Paul in the book of Romans. Again, Paul quotes this verse from Psalm 14 to prove, again, to prove that it, there are no righteous people in the world. What does it say in verse 3? They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. So Paul says, you see, right from the Jewish Bible, a proof. You can't be good. There are no good people. So again, what is Paul ignoring? Paul ignores the context. Let's just look at the chapter in general. Psalm 14. The fool says in their heart, there is no God. This is not a chapter about every person on the planet. It's a chapter about those fools who deny the existence of God. The fool says in their heart, there is no God. They, not, not everybody on the planet, they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good, not in general, again, the whole world, among this group of people we're talking about in Psalm 14. God looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise who seek after God. They, this group that we're talking about, have all gone astray. They are alike perverse. There is no one who does good, no, not one. Have they no knowledge, all evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and who do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great terror, for God is with them the generation or the company of the righteous. This passage speaks about there being righteous people in the world. Again, it's one of those passages in the Bible that contrasts the wicked with the righteous. 